Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Audrey Howe, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. I'd like to welcome you to our second speaker series of the year. February is a very special month to us, as it was the month that the museum opened in 1991. This month we're celebrating I Love My Maritime Museum, and we love your participation. The museum currently has a digital board on its website, and we'd love to see you post on what you love about the museum. Just a note, or a story, or a favorite photo. Anything you'd like to share would be great. We also have some great exhibitions coming up. April brings us the Oxnard High School District Art Show, and we will have all the students bringing in their art to be in a jury competition. And then we'll follow that up in May with the Sailor's Folk Art Exhibition. And in September, we will be bringing Tales of the Whale Whisperer. Just want to say thank you to everyone who has supported the museum throughout the years, and thank you especially for standing by the museum during this current pandemic year. So let's get started. In the mid-1990s, biologists on the northern islands of San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz began to notice a decline in their island fox populations. By 2000, the northern populations were crashing toward extinction. As an example, in San Miguel Island Fox in 1994, there were approximately 450 foxes. By 2000, only 15 individuals remained. Through conservation, which included a variety of measures and also included a rapid response on the part of land managers at the Channel Islands National Park, Nature Conservancy, and Catalina Island Conservancy, government agencies and public and private organizations saved the four endangered island fox populations from extinction. Founded in 2005, Friends of the Island Fox is a 501c3 organization committed to continually supporting and conserving the island fox. We are very pleased to have two members of Friends of the Island Fox here with us today. Carrie Dearborn is President and Program Director of Friends of the Island Fox. She earned her BA from UCLA and her Master's in Environmental Education from CSU San Bernardino. She's an educator, author, and a science curriculum developer. When she heard an island fox barking in the wild in 2017, she knew the past 15 years had been a success. Mike Watling is chair of the Board of Directors of Friends of the Island Fox. And Mike brings experience as a California naturalist and a naturalist volunteer with Channel Island National Park and National Marine Sanctuary. He has contributed to wildlife monitoring for Oka Valley Land Conservancy restoration efforts, as well as monitoring wildlife for California State University Channel Islands as part of campus recovery efforts post the Springs Fire. Mike is certified in wildlife track and sign interpretation with from CyberTrack International, the international standard for wildlife tracking. He has followed the Island Fox recovery since 2000 and has been a part of Friends of the Island Fox since 2016. We would like to welcome both Carrie and Mike here today to our speaker series. Thank you very much. Mike and I are very excited to be here today. Um, we wish we could be seeing all of you in person, but we're going to try and reach through the camera to you to help you understand why we're so enthusiastic about island foxes and what has been going on with island foxes. You can always find out the latest information on the status of island foxes on our website, islandfox.org. And you can always reach out to us through the website as well if you have questions that you're not seeing answers to. So as she said in the wonderful introduction, let's, there we go. Friends of the Island Fox came into being after this was happening on the Northern Islands, this dramatic crash of four populations with the San Miguel and the Santa Rosa foxes getting down to just 15 individuals. So we had four populations that were on their way towards extinction. And at that time, nobody was really clear on what the causes were. But we, since then, have come to understand that on the northern islands, the cause was ecosystem collapse. And on the southern island, on Catalina, it was the introduction of a lethal virus. 
And that whole notion has more resonance with all of us now as we're experiencing it ourselves. But this is what the Foxes also went through in 1998. The exciting thing about the island foxes is, is that it is the fastest recovery of an endangered mammal in North American history. And that is because of all of these people working together. The scientists, the various agencies, the different land managers, private citizens, even school children, locally and actually across the United States. Everybody all working together to help save this population. So today, this is a very positive story. You can see where we are right now. Population numbers are higher than they've ever been. And I don't know if you can see our actual chart here. Mike's going to, I don't know if it helps you or if it changes. Does that help? You can see that the numbers we're looking at for island foxes right now are the highest they've ever been. These are the official numbers from 2019. Foxes are counted during the summer and the fall. 2020 has been a challenging year for all of the land managers, so a lot of stoppage of counting and then restarting again. And we'll have official numbers from 2020 in May. But we're expecting all of the numbers to have dropped just slightly in a natural drop because of the fact that we had low rainfall last year. And so we all look at the rainfall in multiple ways because rainfall has a direct impact on the survivability of the next group of pups out on the islands. All right. So because of this dramatic return of the island fox, it means that when people go out to the islands, everybody now has the opportunity to potentially see an island fox and experience them out in the wild again. When I first started doing this, that was impossible because all of the foxes on the northern islands were in uh, captivity. They were confined in breeding pens on the islands. So in 2000 and Five, if you went out there, you were not going to see an island fox, even though they'd started to release some, but out on the islands, just not enough to actually see them. So what is it about our island foxes that makes them so unique? The island fox is only found on the California Channel Islands, and they have evolved from our mainland gray fox to be their own species. And Mike's going to talk to you about the foxes. So on my right, this is the, the mainland, the mainland gray fox. It's a common fox in North and South America. We find it right here in Ventura County. Uh, I've seen pictures of them in, in people's backyards. Uh, and they're very common out in the, out in the, out in the wild here in the Los Padres National Forest. And my left is the island fox. And you can see it looks very similar in color. They both have that black and gray kind of grizzled color with uh, black running down the, down the spine on both animals and a black tip of its tail. Uh, but this, this one's a little bit smaller. It's about 20% smaller than the common gray fox that's, that's found here. And this is a result of what is known as island dwarfism. So as Carrie's gonna mention shortly, uh, the foxes have been out in the islands for about seven to 9,000 years. And as a result, uh, they've shrunk in size. So the uh, gray foxes were introduced out there and over time they evolved into the uh, small diminutive fox that we have today out that inhabits our Channel Islands. Thanks, Mike. So when I first started doing this, the question was, how did island foxes get out there? And everybody thought that island foxes were probably a result of the Ice Age. We've had pygmy mammoths out on the islands during the last Ice Age, they were there until about 12,000 years. 
when we had a glacial maximum, water levels were lower, it was believed that mammoths were able to swim just the four miles from the mainland out to the islands and then become inhabitants out on the one big island that it was at that time. And it was thought, well, maybe that foxes had floated out there and everybody kind of joked, maybe they took a boat. Turned out they did take a boat going out there because we now know that, as Mike was saying, island foxes have only been separate from their gray fox ancestor for about 9,000 years. So new Mike mitochondrial DNA research has shown that we have a single female line introduced to Santa Cruz Island around 9,000 years ago. Most likely a pair of foxes was brought out by the Chumash people. Around that same time, two female lines very close after that were introduced to Santa Rosa and then a single female line to San Miguel. And then around 7,000 years ago, the Chumash traded at least one, we believe one female fox, probably with a partner, with a mate, to Catalina Island. Then around 5,700 years ago, a single female line gets introduced to San Nicolas Island. And then for just a little bit of time scale of where we are, then the pyramids are built. So we're still talking about a long time ago. And then we get the introduction to San Nicolas Island from Catalina around 3,000 years ago. And then later, much later, about 500 years ago, we get a single female again introduced to Catalina Island. So island foxes have a direct connection with someone else out on the islands. People. We know that there's, there's fossil record of people out on the islands 14,000 years ago. So island foxes are the result of humans taking gray foxes to the islands and then the foxes evolving on those islands for thousands of years on separate islands to become different from their original ancestor and to become subspecies on each one of those islands. So if we look at the foxes that are on the different islands, the Santa Cruz Island fox is the smallest of all of them. If all island foxes were the size of the Santa Cruz fox, they'd be the smallest, they'd be definitely the smallest fox in North America and really close to being the smallest fox in the world. But, Catalina fox is bigger, more robust, heavier, stockier, so it's a bigger island fox. Santa Nicholas Island, you can see there's a dramatic change in coloration in some of the foxes on San Nicholas. This is blending in with their environment there. It's a much sandier environment, less vegetation. Santa Rosa Island foxes, they have more of a grassland area so longer legs, bigger ears, because they're doing more hunting in the grassland rather than in chaparral. So each one of the islands, the foxes are slightly different from each other, and that includes their tails. Mike, can you just hold that up real quick? We're going to try and not get too close to each other. But um, <laughs> island foxes, one of the differences they have from their ancestor is a much shorter tail. We don't know why this is. We don't know what it's genetically connected to. And that length of tail varies from island to island, including the number of bones in the tail, the number of vertebra. So there's as much as seven vertebra difference in the shortest to the longest of the island fox tails. We'd love to know why that is. I'm sure it's connected to something else important for survival. <laughs> The other thing about island foxes is not only are they physically different, something that we can see in their bones and in their anatomy, they have a different behavior. And if we had lost those four subspecies, we would have lost this information. Their behavior is dramatically different from their ancestor. Gray foxes are very shy animals. They're typically seen at night or what we call crepuscular, at twilight, because they have predators themselves. Coyotes, mountain lions, bobcats, people are all predators of the gray fox. But our island fox is the top predator on the islands. He is 
literally the top dog. He has no predator. So they are active around the clock, which is called cathemal, hunting day and night, which is another reason why people have such a good opportunity to see them, because they're just as active in the middle of the day. They also are more omnivorous. In order to survive out there on the islands where the food resources are limited, they eat a wider range of food. So they eat a large percentage of their diet consuming insects and also the native fruits. So the toyon berries, the Catalina cherries, the prickly pear cactus. They're eating a lot of different kinds of native fruit. Now this long history that island foxes have with the Chumash people also has created an unusual behavior for a wild canine in that they are what we call habituated to people. It is a mistake to think of them as pets. The Chumash did not keep them as pets. You may hear people say that, but that is not true. We have scientific evidence that in cases where the foxes were in uh, very close proximity with the native people, and in some cases even in ceremonial burials on a couple of the islands, the bones of those animals reveal that they continued to eat their native foods, rodents, berries. They were not eating the seafood diet that was primarily the diet of the humans that lived out there. So the people weren't feeding them. We believe that because of the deer mice that are out on those islands that can really increase in population dramatically, which would have been a threat to the native people's seed foods that they gathered, that probably it makes sense that gray foxes would have been brought out there to try to control rodent populations so that the rodents weren't eating the people's food. We don't have any scientific evidence of that as of yet, but there's a it just is a kind of a common sense thing that people are leaning toward, that that could have been why they were originally introduced out there. But they were not pets. But because they're used to people, and like a couple of people have talked about here today, before we started, it is not unusual to be walking on a path on the island and have a fox be on the same path, and the fox wants to walk on that path. If you just step to the side, I've had this happen to, my, to myself as well, the fox will just walk on past you because he's walking on the path and he expects you to share it with him. It's, <laughs> it's this relationship that these foxes have had with humans, they consider themselves kind of equal to humans. And it's another reason why you have such a great opportunity to see them out there. Now, we look out at the islands today, and they're beautiful and they look pristine, but they're actually dramatically changed from what they were, especially in the native vegetation. And this is the beginning of our ecosystem collapse out there across the islands. This is Santa Rosa, and you can see that looking across from the Torrey Pines towards the area where the harbor is, where the boat comes and drops you off, there's very little chaparral mostly grass. Now it is changing now, but a lot of that chaparral that had originally been there was eaten away by domestic farm animals that were taken out to the islands. So by the time we get to 1880, every single one of our Channel Islands, even the smallest of them, Santa Barbara, is being used as a ranch by people because they can keep animals there, they don't have to have a fence, and those animals start to eat away the native vegetation because those plants had been evolving on that island. They had been without a predator themselves, without a big herbivore since the mammoths went extinct. So there was nobody that they needed to protect themselves from. Most of them don't have spines, they don't have chemical toxins in their leaves or in their fruit. They've changed dramatically because they don't have to use that energy to protect themselves. But when you put sheep and goats and pigs and deer and elk onto the islands, these are all animals who are browsers. And they really did a lot of damage to the native chaparral. Now also living on the island historically were bald eagles. 
The bald eagle is a very big predatory bird. And its primary food is the fish, the marine resources that it has around the islands, as well as seabirds. Typically does not feed on mammals. So therefore, it has really no interest in the island fox. And in fact, they kind of live in a harmony with each other. We've seen documentation of uh, the eagle cams where island foxes will come right up into that nest and they will eat the remains of food that the chicks have not eaten because eagle chicks are very messy eaters. They don't eat everything. And so the foxes, they come up there and they kind of tidy up, but they're too small to be a threat to a bald eagle chick once it's over two weeks old. So it's, there's no conflict there. And typically the bald eagle is not preying on the fox because its preferred food are fish and seabirds. Bald eagles are very territorial, and because they were in pairs out on the islands, they helped to keep away other large predatory birds. But the, as the island ecosystem is changing, there's less foliage for foxes to hide in. There's less of the fruit resources that they needed to eat. Things changing slightly. And then after World War II, we have a big impact to the islands. DDT that was used across the South Pacific to protect our soldiers from malaria and other insect-borne diseases is then used across the nation, but a great deal of it used in agriculture here in California, used around homes to spray and kill insects, and washing down in our streams, our rivers, into the ocean, as well as the fact that it was made here in Southern California, and at times just flushed a couple times directly into the LA River and therefore impacting our marine environment. Because DDT does not go away. It settles in particles into the riverbed, little things like sh shrimps and worms. They eat that, they get it, consume it, it's in their body, it builds up. It might not kill that animal, but the fish comes along. He then now has that toxic level of the DDT in the fish's body, the eagle comes along, eats the fish, eating multiple fish with this toxic level, the bald eagle gets that toxin building up in its body. And it might not kill the bald eagle, but DDT seems to have a, an impact on calcium absorption. And for a female eagle who needs to have a lot of calcium in her body built up so that when she goes to lay an egg, she can use that calcium to make an eggshell, she couldn't do that. She, they would lay eggs that would have these eggshells that would just collapse when the birds went to incubate them. So they could not reproduce. So over a period of time, we get to the 1960s, there are no bald eagles living out on our Channel Islands anymore. There are no bald eagles in Southern California. When I grew up here in the 60s, I had no idea that there even had been bald eagles here. It was just something that, that was always a bird we saw far away, not here in California. As DDT, we stopped using DDT in the 1970s, but the eagle that made a comeback first was less impacted by DDT. That was the golden eagle. It is basically the same size as the bald eagle, but it has a dramatically different lifestyle. It's a mammal specialist, and it typically eats things about the size of a football, like a rabbit, a ground squirrel, but it will also eat a deer fawn or an elk calf when they're small. And they were attracted to the islands by all those feral pigs that were on Santa Cruz. The sheep, they would also take lambs. There was no bald eagles to keep the golden eagle away. And golden eagles migrate up and down our coast twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. And if a golden eagle stopped at the island, for a few days, that might not be a problem. But there was no bald eagle to make them leave the islands. So as, as we heard in the introduction, 
1994, rangers start to think, we're not seeing as many foxes. But they didn't see any dead foxes. They didn't have any proof that there were fewer foxes. They just felt it. That's when the foxes were first counted on San Miguel Island. Then we get to 1998, and they really think they are not seeing foxes the way they used to see foxes. So they capture 12 of them, and they get little radio collars like this. And the radio collar goes on the fox's neck, and as the fox moves around in the environment, we can track where that fox is, but then if that fox stops moving for six to eight hours, this gives off a special signal called a mortality signal. Then the biologist can go right to that location and figure out what happened to that fox. Now in less than two weeks, one of the foxes that was wearing a radio collar gave out a mortality signal. And when the biologists went to the location, what they found was part of a fox and a great big feather. The golden eagles had started to eat the foxes. They were out in the middle of the day. They never had had a predator before. They didn't know to look up. And they're small year round where piglets get big. Now it can be hard to imagine that an eagle was eating these foxes, but Mike's gonna show you how big an eagle is. Maybe I'll take one little slide right here. This is the size of a golden eagle. Go ahead. And this is the eagle's claw. So if you can imagine that this claw has kind of one purpose, and that's to subdue its prey. And if we go back to our island fox, this is a claw that can easily take down uh, an island fox. And that's essentially what was happening. As Carrie mentioned, um, there was aerial bombardment and they had, they had no idea it was coming. So they figured that foxes were disappearing. In, by the time we get to 2,000, a fox a day. But the crazy thing is, we can't show you a photo of this because no one's no one ever saw it actually happen. There's some gruesome pictures of golden eagle nests lined with fox bodies because the golden eagles were actually living on the islands, reproducing on the islands. But nobody even had any idea how many of them there were. So because of this dramatic drop, and then the fact that on Catalina, they were having the same kind of catastrophic decline at exactly the same time, but it had absolutely nothing to do with eagles. On Catalina Island, a canine distemper of dog virus was introduced to the islands by a North American raccoon, it happened. And within a year and a half, this temper had spread across the whole island, and the only thing that saved the foxes on Catalina is this right here, that little narrowing, that isthmus on the island. Because foxes don't go across the isthmus very often. There's a town there called Two Harbors, and it's a narrow area, and typically, I have to say typically now, because now there are, as of last week, big questions about this. Um, typically, Foxes did not go across that. Um, so that kept the disease from passing to the northern part of the island. Because distemper uh, is the equivalent of measles in humans. It's highly contagious. Foxes just have to pass each other, sniff each other's droppings. It's highly contagious. Now everybody thought, oh, that's crazy, a raccoon going out to the island. That is a once in a lifetime thing. We now know that that is not true. Once we started to look, 
We now know that it happens two to three times typically every year. Either a raccoon or on occasion, we've also had opossums in the last couple of years, stow away on people's boats. And this is so exciting to be standing here looking at boats <laughs> because I know you're all thinking, that's crazy, I would never have a raccoon on my boat. <laughs> But the problem is, down in Marino del Rey, which is where they know that these raccoons came from, and I'm sure it's probably somewhat true up here, marinas have a lot of trash that people take off their boats and they put in trash cans. And it attracts raccoons. And raccoons are sly little creatures who will get out onto boats, they'll find a place to be completely content on a boat, and the people on the boat don't even know that they're there. It's, this is what happens time and time again, people going out to Catalina, they get almost into the harbor and they do the right thing. They contact the harbor master and they say, we have a raccoon on our ship and on our boat. And multiple times this has happened where the harbor master and a bunch of people, they all go out there to get, grab that raccoon on that boat before it comes into the harbor. The raccoon jumps off, swims to shore, and in one case that was very well documented by the Catalina Island Conservancy, they all went out there to try to catch this raccoon. It got to the shore, got away from everybody. Within two days, it was in the center of the island. If it had been a diseased raccoon, it would have passed through all these different fox territories, and it would have been another disaster. So it's a, it is a big deal. It's what we call biosecurity. So because these catastrophic things were happening at the same time, an amazing thing happened. The government agencies, the national park system, the private groups, the Catalina Island Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, the Navy, private citizens like Friends of the Island Fox, everybody came together to work together to solve these problems. And it has made a huge impact for the island fox and has actually become a model for other endangered species. We have what's called the Island Fox Working Group that meets every single year, even to this day. And every year we're discussing what the new challenges are for island foxes. So island foxes went into captive breeding facilities on the four islands where they lived. There was talk of moving them off the islands to special facilities, but Everybody decided it would just be better to leave them on their islands where they lived. So they had special areas that were built for them, two foxes in each enclosure, because they're highly territorial, so adults don't necessarily get along, and they mate for life. So they could reproduce in that captive situation. And while they were captive and protected, these changes had to go on, on restoring that ecosystem. So bald eagles were reintroduced to the islands. We now have over 30 pairs. Yeah, there's between 40 and 60 pairs out in the islands now, Which the northern is, islands. Which is a totally amazing thing. We've had over 100 chicks hatch out on the islands. And they're coming to the mainland? Yeah. Yes, they're coming to the to mainland. To establish new territory, so that is excellent news. Over 44 golden eagles were captured in just five years and relocated to Northern California. So that stopped the colonization of the golden eagles on the islands. We have not had a death to a golden eagle now in over seven years. So that problem is pretty much a problem of the past for us. All the domestic animals were removed. That was a big part of keeping the golden eagle away, as well as the elk and the deer on Santa Rosa Island that had been brought out there for captive hunting. And with the continuing process of restoring the native plants out across the islands. So by November of 2008, foxes are all back out in the wild again. And if you look at our numbers, you can really see that everything starts to climb faster after 2008 with the, well, even for the Miguel foxes, the reddish one, because they mate for life. And when you're being matched together in pairs by humans who are looking at your DNA and not your personalities, you're not necessarily with the mate you would like to be with. 
So once they were back out in the wild, had space, and could choose their own partners, reproduction happened much faster because they are canine, they will adjust the number of pups they have in relationship to the resources they have. So while it's typical for them to have one to two pups each year, when they have lots of space, lots of resources, they can have as many as five pups. So that made a dramatic difference when they were all out there in the wild. Now, San Miguel, people look at that and they think, what happened? It's not going up in the same way. San Miguel is a much smaller island, and we believe that the largest number of foxes that can live out on that island and be able to live sustainably is between 400 and 500. And so we do sometimes see, we did see a drop there between 2016 and 2018. Actually, it continued into, well, I guess it was 17 was the one I'm thinking of too, but it's, they were really impacted by the drought. Um, they don't have as many resources, not as many native plants on San Miguel, and so that has a huge impact on them. Drought can really stress and reduce pup populations. We went for four years on San Miguel with no noticeable reproduction. Fewer than five pups produced. But you can see we've got a good, 2019 was a good year. Really dramatic increase in the, pop, the foxes out on San Miguel. So now today, foxes are what we call a conservation management dependent species. They're always going to need people to help them because we've had such an impact on their environment and we will continue to have that impact. So they need us to help them going forward, and part of that are the health checks that they have every year. Every year between the summer and the late fall, foxes are counted across the islands, and it's different depending on the land manager when they actually count and the methodology that they use. But basically, foxes are captured in a have-a-heart type trap then they get a health check, and we're looking at their general health. Weight is really an important one for us. So what we're hearing right now is that the foxes were captured in 2020. Everybody had a good, stable weight. We're not seeing foxes that are emaciated because of lack of food. Everybody's looking healthy across the islands right now, which is really good. They get an ID microchip, just like your dog or your cat might get. That helps us to identify them as individuals because you might have been noticing, seeing these pictures, they all kind of look a lot alike. <laughs> so this way we can know if you're a fox and you're caught as a pup and you get your ID microchip, we're going to know exactly how old you were your whole life. We're going to know, ah, on Catalina, we had a female who crossed the isthmus. She got captured on one side, and then two years later, captured on the other side of the isthmus. That's an unusual thing. This year, three foxes crossed the isthmus. So it's a big question. Why is that happening? But those microchips help us to know that. And when a fox gets captured, some of them like to go in for the snack that's put into the trap and so they might get captured more than one time. And so then, just like your dog or cat goes to the vet and they use that reader to read the microchip, they read the microchip and they can go, oh, we caught this fox yesterday or two days ago, and they can just let it go. It's not handled at all. They also get evaluated for parasites or disease. This was a really big issue for us uh, in some of the drought years. Ticks and fleas became a big problem on some of the islands. And we do blood samples because just like we are all learning about disease for ourselves, this biosecurity issue is a primary problem for foxes across the islands. So you can see that on the Catalina Express one New Year's Day, we had a raccoon that took the Catalina Express with all those people all the way to Catalina before somebody saw it. Fortunately, it didn't get off. It ended up going all the way back to Marina del Rey. But people's dogs, 
there are cats on the islands, all of these are disease vectors. And we're also potentially seeing climate change migrants, birds, other animals who are coming up from the south who didn't used to come here, potentially introducing new disease, new parasites. So we test for five viruses every year on Catalina because that is the island that is most impacted by humans. And we're looking for a range of diseases. Adenovirus is dog flu. And you can see prior to 2015, adenovirus was not something we found on the islands, not on Catalina. But in 2016, we had a huge spike. By 2017, 85% of the foxes on the island had encountered it. They had the titers, the immune system response to having encountered it on the island. This is the same speed of transmission that we saw with canine distemper. So it really shows us, yes, this is how fast a disease can spread across the island, especially when we have lots of foxes on the island. They're closer together. It's easier for disease to spread. But fortunately, it was not a life-threatening disease. We did not see any mortalities from that, and it is slowly declining in the environment. And occasionally, kind of hard to see, but in 2017, going into 2018, all of a sudden we had a herpes virus that showed up out there, and they were really concerned. It was found in, on a, in a fox um, around Avalon. And they were really concerned because the herpes virus can spread quickly in canines. But this strain turned out to be not a problem, and it quickly disappeared. This is one of our early detections of finding out about new viruses that have been introduced to the islands. And we're starting a discussion with the managers on Catalina. They're considering testing for more things, thinking outside of the box, as that has all impacted us as humans in this past year, and also about increasing the number of foxes that are vaccinated and radio collared around the human habitations on Catalina. So foxes get vaccinated. They get vaccinated for rabies and canine distemper virus. Uh, approximately 100 individuals on most of the islands, Catalina, they vaccinate everybody they catch, except for specific foxes, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So usually around 300 get vaccinated out there on Catalina. And they wear radio collars. Now, originally, everybody who got released into the wild wore a radio collar. But now we have so many foxes, that would just not be feasible. Now the foxes that get radio collars, most of them are what we call sentinel foxes. They're usually one to three years old. They do not get vaccinated. So if something happens to them, it's an immediate alert that we potentially have a disease problem. Um, this is our number one defense against all kinds of diseases. And since foxes are no longer on the endangered species list, there is no federal funding for this anymore. So the cost of this has really come down to the private sector. Last year, we covered nearly all of the radio collars that were purchased for the different islands, and that's the way it's looking again this year. The exciting thing is that we can now refurbish radio collars, so even ones that look really torn up, like that one in the town on the left, for $220, it can be put back together again to look like this, and we're maintaining the same radio frequency that was used because this has become very difficult for us. Everybody with cell phones and everything else is taking up all the radio frequency bandwidth. And so we really need to maintain the frequencies that we use. So you can see this is the, our 50 to 60 foxes are typically radio collared on each island. San Miguel, we now have, there's 70 foxes out there that are radio collared because we've had health issues out there, so this is a higher range of, of watching the foxes on San Miguel, and that we're also thinking about doing that in Catalina. But it's gonna help us to also, if we have an injured fox, it will get radio collared, and then we can monitor it while it's still out in the wild, but we can see how it's doing. 
And our friend from Alan Fox in the last three years has gotten very involved in research because there's so much we don't know about foxes. When we first started doing this, thank goodness, there were foxes that were in captivity in eight zoos. They'd come off uh, San Clemente Island for a, another endangered species that was in danger on San Clemente, and the foxes had been preying on the loggerhead shrike, and they needed a, to have fewer foxes in that area. So fortunately, those foxes were being raised in captivity, and so somebody had an idea on what to feed them. Because when we had the crisis happen, foxes came into captivity quickly, and there really wasn't time to do that kind of finding out. But fortunately, the Santa Barbara Zoo was already the, the leader in that. They are the ones that manage all of the foxes that are in captivity. And so they had already established what dietary needs the foxes needed. But we're really concerned about drought impacts on diet, how that impacts foxes, not only for the changing what they eat, but also specifically putting them, it's looking like it moves them to having less of a range of what they eat, which means whatever those resources are, there's more pressure on it. Because if we all went to a restaurant and we ate different things, that's one thing. But if we all walked in and ate exactly the same thing, that's a big impact on what's available for resources. So we're looking at that. We're looking at which foxes are actually using marine resources. Do we have foxes that are doing that? If they are, where are they doing that? Are there some places that are more important for use of marine resources than others? We're also looking at how to determine them accurately by, for their age. Because right now, it's just an estimate off the wear of their teeth. And we're also looking at their relationship with the island spotted skunk, because we basically know nothing about that. And our latest research grant recipient is uh, Alexandra de Candia, and she is looking at the microbiome and the health. So the microbiome are the microbes, the bacteria, the flora that are on your body and in your body. But what happens when a population goes through that genetic bottleneck? How does that impact that? And then what impact might that have on their overall health? So island foxes considered recovered in 2016. We want to show you an island fox. Let's see if this is going to play. It looks like it's not. OK. We'll just go to the next slide. So across all the islands, island foxes are doing very well. And that has to do with people. We caused this problem, but people have had a very positive impact to turn things around for island foxes. And everything we do, I look out at these boats and I'm thinking, hmm, could we do something here to make sure that people are looking for things, animals that they might accidentally be taking out to the islands? Um, because in the northern islands, we don't have as many eyes looking for what might come off of somebody's boat when they do go to Santa Cruz Island or to Santa Rosa Island. How many people do we know who go to one of the islands and they let their dog go ashore with them so that the dog can go to the bathroom? Not realizing that the dog can pass disease to the foxes, it can also pick up disease from the foxes. So there's a lot that we all can do to help to keep this very special animal that we have here on our islands and no place else in the world healthy and safe. Now we would love to take any questions that you might have about island foxes. Yes? How do you, how do you count them? I mean, your numbers are very large and you don't have any way to you want to take that mic? <laughs> One, two. <laughs> no, so they, they count over, or they trap over a certain period. Uh, they have, there's grids set up on the islands. Um, and uh, they basically are, are trapping over X number of nights um, at, at given periods of time. And based on statistical analysis, you look at um, 
you know, how many foxes you're capturing in that period, how many repeat foxes, like Carrie mentioned, some of the foxes will um, like to come back in to, to grab some of that kibble and treat. Um, you know, might still be no activity. So basically that all goes into a, a, a kind of a capture, mark, recapture program that, that statistically analyzes how many foxes there are, are out there. And they, they come up with a number and then they come up with confidence intervals around that number. So the number we're looking at is kind of that center, you know, that center point and then it's plus or minus X number of foxes per square kilometer out there. And then based on the size of the islands, based on what we know about foxes, we kind of can then therefore determine that when you reach a population like we're seeing on um, you know, uh, Santa Cruz Island with, with almost 2,700 foxes. You look at the size of that island, that's about 7 to 15 foxes per square kilometer. That island is now really reaching its capacity. Um, and so this is kind of where they're going to expect numbers to kind of bounce around between maybe 24 and, and 29 or 3,000 foxes would be kind of what they're expecting to, to, to see. Right. Do you, have, do you have a separate team on each island to do this, or, or is it one team that goes to all the islands? How do, you, how do you do that? So the Navy, the Department of Defense the, and the Navy manages San Miguel, I mean uh, San Clemente and San Nicolas Island. So they have biologists that uh, out of Point Magoo and San Diego that manage those, those islands and are responsible for those islands. The National Park takes care of um, the, the biologists out there, take care of uh, Santa Rosa and Miguel, and then the Nature Conservancy on Santa Cruz takes care of the Santa Cruz portion of the island, and then Catalina Island Conservancy counts the foxes on Catalina. Yep. And then they, they go into this database, and um, sometimes it's, it's a, a little bit of a different database, and then they look and they kind of manage and agree on what the numbers are. So it's a really, it's a drawn out process. Yes? Oh, this is a big question. This is why it's so important that we figure out uh, the most accurate way to age them. Now a fox who's caught as a pup and has a microchip, we then know exactly how long it lived. So we know that we had a female fox on Santa Cruz who was born in captivity and she lived to be 12 years old. But that is, ex we believe, an anomaly on Santa Cruz. Now on Catalina, they used to have foxes live to be 10 to 12 on a fairly regular basis. But is that changed now because there's higher densities of foxes, more competition? Our concern has really been San Miguel, where we have a smaller population because of the size of the island. And we did have, during the drought, we had some pretty bad years where the number dropped to like around 200, which is not good. And the question was, though, how old are the foxes when they're dying? Because a fox who lives to be six, well, actually, I can actually yeah. show you this. If I go quickly. To teeth. So a fox, well, this is why we're looking at these teeth. The teeth are laying down these layers that are supposed to be an annual layer. So we're looking to see if that's going to a actually document how old a fox is when it dies. And this is important because if a fox has a lifespan and she's four years old, she's going to, during her life, maybe have three to 12 pups. But if she's living to be eight, she's having between seven and 32 pups. It's a huge difference. So if the foxes on San Miguel are dying at old age, their lifespan is only six, where it's 10 on Catalina, that's, potential, that's a potential difference in how we manage those populations. So we're really looking for this way to determine how old they really are. 
Um, currently, the foxes on Rosa and Miguel seem to be living around eight years lifespan, maybe shorter on Miguel. So that really hasn't been looked at closely since we've had carrying capacity populations. So it's really become a big issue for us to figure that out. Because looking at how their teeth are worn is not, let's see if I can do this correctly. This is kind of in the weeds. But if you, across the bottom, we've got their known age. And then up the side, we have their age class, so what their guest age was. So our two researchers, what they did was they looked at individuals who they knew how old they were, and then they blinded that to see how they would come out looking at their records, their health records, from what people estimated their age to be. And if a fox was four years old, you can see the biggest dot was that it was, well, maybe around three to four years old. But then it also was considered, oh, it might be as old as the fourth age class, which is like eight to 10. So it's really a guesstimate, and it's just not a good way to age these foxes. So um, we just got the first report back on this, and the tooth evaluation is really good up to age six, would you say? Four. Four. Um, but then there's questions as we get older, and um, we think we only looked at, they only had teeth from four animals who were seven to older, and we just think we need to expand that. So they currently, when they capture the foxes, they're looking at the first upper molar. So you can see that this is an island fox skull. They're looking up here and they're estimating based on where, tooth wear. So if you imagine a fox that's diet is mostly prickly pear cactus fruit, it's kind of soft, there's not going to be a lot of wear. A fox that's maybe on the southern or western end of the island that's eating marine resources and getting that sand, the wear is going to be much, much greater for a fox that's that same age. And right. so it becomes difficult. You know, they're saying, oh, this fox is six when maybe it's only really four years old. Or you can see you start getting kind of these, un kind of these unknowns, which impacts how uh, the, the, man the land managers are going to kind of manage those populations. So. And this whole tooth wear process evaluation was actually uh, originated in the Carolinas in the 50s for gray foxes. So it's really kind of a leap to use our island foxes. Their, their diet is so different, they live considerably longer than those gray foxes do in the Carolinas. So um, we're, we're really hoping that this is going to help us figure out how old they get to be. Because it's a really good question. <laughs> yes? Has there ever been any foul or any, any, uh, any sign of them ever having been on uh, Manicapa? Oh, that's a mic question? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, it's a mic question. And um, yeah, so what's kind of exciting is there has been I think it's three or four bone fragments found on Anacapa. Um, that's not to say that the foxes ever populated Anacapa. They don't know if perhaps this was a fox that was with its somehow got transported there, because if, if you recall from Chumash lectures, Anacapa was a stopover. It was closest island from here. Uh, they could go in, they would stop. The they would, um, and so in trying to stay away from the fox, it, they weren't going into some areas of the island. Foxes can't get down into those sea caves, but the skunks can. They're more agile in that way. And they were going into the sea caves and eating the eggs and the chicks of rare endangered seabirds. And so this became a big issue. The seabird people were saying, you got to do something about the skunks. And fortunately, as the fox population increased, it helped to mitigate that problem. But if you look at the numbers on Santa Rosa, you can see that Santa Rosa was the last one to return. And this is because in 2007, 
when they were really starting to make a comeback. Everybody was back out in the wild. We did have a golden eagle incident over the course of 10 days, a golden eagle ate seven foxes. It was breeding season. That meant seven groups of pups did not survive. And it just happened to be at like the worst possible time in the recovery, and it pushed Santa Rosa way back. Um, so the skunks there, you know, had a little bit more time to have these huge populations. But I do remember Tim Coonan, who was the biologist in charge of everything at the time, early then. The amazing thing was they had all these skunks, but the majority of them were male. And so they, they knew it wasn't a sustainable thing. And they didn't know why it was happening. And that happened with the foxes as well in captivity, in captive breeding. After a number of years, we ended up on Miguel and Santa Rosa. One was producing females and one was producing males. We don't know why. And there was, there was big talk. Should we move one for here and for there? No, we got to keep them separate. They're, they're separate subspecies. But it was a big concern. And it was part of what led to we got to put them all out because reproduction was slowing down and it had become, a, it had become gender specific. And whether or not that is some sort of adaptation for controlling your population on an island, these guys have thousands of years of surviving on the islands. And we now think that San Nicolas Island went through a bottleneck in the 70s where they got down to a very small population because when they did Oh, I'm going the wrong way. When they did genetic research on them mm -hmm. with uh, samples that were from the 80s. So if you look, it's kind of, kind of tricky to see, but a, an, an animal is supposed to have a lot of diversity in its genetic material. And on that top one, A, you can kind of see a shadow. The shadow is a gray fox. It has all these peaks and valleys of genetic variation on its chromosomes. But the two San Nicolas Island foxes, hardly anything. And it, it's actually considered to be a flatline, which is not good. Um, but fortunately, the areas where they do have genetic diversity is in response to disease. And that seems to be help for them. I mean, when I first went to the meetings of the working group in 2002, going into 2005, the geneticists were pretty adamant that you could not save the Miguel and the Rosa foxes because you did not have enough genetic diversity. Because while we have 15 foxes here, only 12 of them reproduced on each island, each island only had four males. So everybody on Santa Rosa, we have 24, 27, you know, two, almost 24,000 foxes. They all go back to four paternal lines in 2000. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But obviously, this is what the biologists, some of the people who are around the longest always thought, these foxes have been through these things before. That's why they have the variation that they have, and they just seem to be somewhat resilient. As long as we don't get a disease introduced out there that they have no immunity to, and because they're an isolated population, that is the primary concern right now. Yeah. It certainly is a juggling act. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, one thing knocks something else off. <laughs> yeah. Caves, sea caves. And right, right. It's such a juggle. It's such a feat of juggling. Yeah. So when they did this analysis of the San Nicolas Island fox, it had the least genetic diversity of any mammal in the world. And that was, they had not, they still have not looked at the Miguel and the Rosa foxes from 2000. So, yeah, if there's a good chance that they're going to look like that also. <laughs> yeah. And this is our concern on, the, on San Miguel. We have a parasite problem, which um, 
We still don't know if it's uh, endemic to San Miguel or if it's been introduced from somewhere else because it's a kind of nasty intestinal worm that that exact species has not been identified anywhere else in the world. Why are the foxes on San Miguel getting it? And why do they not seem to be able to fight it off in any way? It causes mortalities. But they have other intestinal issues. And that's why we think this biome is potentially important. Because we know on Catalina, gosh, about 10 years ago, Catalina foxes had the second highest rate of cancer of any mammal in the world. They were second only to the Tasmanian devil. They were getting cancer in their ear canal, tumors, and initially everybody thought it was cat mites, ear mites, in their ear causing inflammation, causing tumors, and then becoming cancer. But it turned out they were the same ear mites that all the other foxes had. So why were they having this inflammatory problem that nobody else seemed to be having? And uh, Dr. DeCandia, now she's a doctor, um, she, her microbiome study, they swabbed the inside of the ears of the foxes on Catalina and then also under their tail to look at their gut flora. And what they found in the ears of foxes with increased inflammation was that they have unusually high levels of staphylococcus. And staphylococcus is the dominant bacteria in their ear and then they seem to have a greater response, immune system response, and just kind of feedbacks on itself. So treating the ear mites has knocked out the cancer completely. But now we know, hey, they've got this problem microbially. What can we do to change that? Is it necessarily the problem? So right now we're looking at all the other islands, um, and we're looking at the intestinal flora, because does Miguel have an issue where they have decreased biodiversity in their gut flora that is impacting the... Yeah. There's so much complication, but the exciting thing is we see more and more the science that's going on on the islands being used other places out in the world. Yeah. So it's been very exciting to be a part of all this, to see a change, and to see us now being able to do research that is impacting other endangered species because we think of our islands as a unique thing, but lots of animals live in habitat islands. Even if they're surrounded by land, they're in habitat islands. So we have the same kinds of issues. So it's been, it's been an exciting journey for all of us and it keeps getting more interesting all the time. Well, thank you for what you do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great All right. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well.